best is missed unless Pop's around. He can't stop hopping when the cereal's popping. Pop makes the world go round. Snip, quack, oh. pop, rice krispies. <laughs> And we continue, folks. Number one. If this tribe of people, the Hyksos, caused the Great Pyramid to be constructed, did they know their message wouldn't be understood for thousands of years, or did they think that humans would grasp its meaning a little bit before that? Number two. I think it's quite apparent that they knew it would be grasped in the 20th century. I think that they laid it out so the core of their meaning would be picked up by those who really had the mathematical know-how. It wasn't until 1905 that we had the real understanding of gravitational astronomy, the astronomy involving the solar system and the movement of the Earth around the sun, down so pat that we had all the answers the builders of the Great Pyramid had. They knew as much or more about today's system of gravitational astronomy as we know. Number one. Do you think this falls in line with a number of other theories that humans were at one time visited by supremely intelligent beings from other worlds? Number two, I don't accept that thesis. However, I believe that there is life probably on every little planetoid in the entire universe, life that is similar to ours, having a spiritual nature but somewhat different in physical nature. No other beings from outer space ever came down here and cohabited with the apes, as Mr. Von Daniken would say. I would reject that thesis, but on the other hand, I would say we are indeed created by another intelligence far greater than this planet or even this solar system. You know, it's a funny thing. I was once an atheist. I went through most of my college days as an atheist. I went through most of my college days as an anthropologist and didn't believe in a creative theory at all. But after studying for many years, I was forced to accept the fact that I obviously had been created because it just didn't happen by chance. There's no way, I would say, that this theory that something in outer space came down and interfered is quite accurate in that respect. We are in the image of a creator of some kind that we can't even conceive. Therefore, we have the ability to do all kinds of fantastic things. I think there was a civilization 50,000 years ago in the Pacific, now underwater, that had in it achievements that we only think of today. Number one. Okay, just a minute. Let me backtrack here. At the beginning of the interview, you mentioned that you began your investigation of the Great Pyramid after you read The Ultimate Frontier. What's it all about? Number two. Oh, that's a big topic. The Ultimate Frontier ties together a history of this planet, the idea and purpose for mankind be a, being a part of it, and a philosophy of growth towards human perfection, and how this philosophy is what life is really all about. The truth of this was lost when the great civilization on the Pacific continent of Mu was destroyed by a sudden cataclysmic change on the crust of the earth 50,000 years ago. There are a group of individuals who call themselves the Brotherhoods, unobtrusively working to uplift mankind back to this ancient wisdom belief, and the Great Pyramid is indeed a monument to this particular Brotherhood. Number one, perhaps the truth is never lost. Perhaps as we evolve towards a true understanding of essentials, we suddenly find ourselves faced with a question where we discover that we have really understood nothing at all and consequently have to begin learning all over again on a new and higher level. Perhaps the memory of the destruction of Mu and other catastrophic events is contained in the collective unconsciousness of man. Perhaps some humans, direct genetic descendants of the survivors of these cataclysmic events, carry in their bloodline a genetic mutation. Let me read that portion again, folks. Perhaps some humans, direct genetic descendants of the survivors of these cataclysmic events, carry in their bloodline a genetic mutation. Perhaps this genetic mutation was deeply imprinted into the central nervous system of some of our forebears who actually experienced and survived a sudden slippage in the Earth's tectonic plates or a supernova explosion. Such a genetic mutation passed in genetic structures or DNA from generation to generation may explain why some of us today are more acutely sensitive to subtle Earth tremors than our neighbors. 
In any case, this book, The Ultimate Frontier, started your mental processes working along these lines. Number two, ah, they were already working along this line, just like many peoples are without knowing about it. I had started into investigation of phenomena and mysticism on my own because my religious convictions couldn't answer my questions. Going to different churches and checking them out, I found, didn't answer my questions as to why I am. I've always wanted to know why. The human physiology is a remarkable thing. Why should it be? Why should we be different than the animals? Why should we have these philosophies when no other animals has philosophy? I studied many of the standard religions, but they couldn't answer my question to my satisfaction. I didn't like the idea of blind faith. I didn't like the idea of blind faith. To me, blind faith is irresponsible and unreasonable. Then I got into science and became an atheist. I was working on a master's degree in anthropology and found that, just like the churches, the information from the scientific side fell short. They can't answer all the questions. In fact, the more we learn, the more anomalies we have, and we realize how little we know. Then my son, who at the time was four and a half years old, nearly drowned. In fact, he did drown. He was full of salt water and unconscious for 45 minutes. He should by all rights have died. The year was 1960. I was eating at a restaurant on the beach when I saw him floating face down in the water. I ran across the beach, jumped into the water, handed him to my brother, who handed him to a strange old man who appeared to be a derelict. When this old man pumped out the water, I was in shock, one of my son for the next 45 minutes. He refused to give my son to the ambulance crew and the doctor who arrived and pronounced him dead. The old man looked into my eyes and said, This boy isn't dead. I'm going to bring him back. I told the doctor, Let him keep trying, and the old man kept working. Forty-five minutes is a long period of time to remain unconscious without breathing. However, my son not only recovered without brain damage from that episode, but he told us in the hospital exactly all of the events that took place, from me running out of that restaurant, jumping across the breakwater, diving into the water, and getting him, handing him up to my brother. He recalled all of this as if he had been watching it as a spectator, and yet he was unconscious. I mean, he wasn't Gene Dixon or anything. That personal experience was positive proof in my mind that the human mind is a lot greater than that body. Number one, did it reinforce a previous belief or did it really serve to allow you to see for the first time that there are other realities? Number two, it made me relook at some of my own experiences. It made me stop and think about a lot of things. For instance, the first thing it made me think of is when I was studying anthropology. I was studying the theory of evolution chance evolution, chemistry just providing a scenario for itself to keep procreating and surviving and improving and so on. If we accept evolution as the ultimate answer, we have to accept a ludicrous notion that atoms, all matter, is made up of the atomic elements, can so arrange themselves as to be able to give themselves abstract qualities such as memory, desire, will, curiosity, consciousness, conscience, creativity, intuition, emotion, and reason. How can you get that chemically? You can't. It has to be something else that is endowed, and man is the only one that has it. A goat doesn't see the stars or know what's over the mountain or know anything about life and death. You see, but we do. These ideas were in my head, and intuitively I knew there was much more. But when that happened to my son, I realized that I, too, am a discrete bundle of mental energy. Only I didn't have that phraseology for it. I didn't know about what life was all about as I feel I do now. Number one, were you able to determine the capability of the human being to deal with all these diverse areas of knowledge? Number two, certainly I'm doing it and I'm nothing extraordinary. I am dealing with all of these areas of knowledge in a relaxed and causal and fun way. And I feel that I am growing. I am not impatient about my growth because I know that someday, if I continue to try to improve myself, if I continue to use those qualities of mind that I have, then I will become as perfect as humanely possible. Now, according to our basic beliefs in this country, human beings are created in the image of their creator. To me, that means we have the same qualities of mind. We're certainly not the physical image, but the mental image. We have will, memory, desire, curiosity, consciousness, creativity, conscience. I've gone through those before. Intuition, emotion, reason. 
Those ten qualities of mind are the same qualities as the Creator has. Perhaps we can never become absolute perfection as the Creator. Whatever it is must have been. I cannot 